Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Hashtag Leadership, What's On Your Mind. Remember, we're a podcast to make you stop and think about your leadership journey, and we're going to bring you some amazing guests with amazing stories and experts in their field. So if you haven't already realised that this is episode 101, so we've just passed our 100th episode. So if you haven't already, make sure you go back and have a listen to that. It's a one hour special. I'm really proud about what it ended up being and some of the feedback has been amazing so far as well. So thank you for everybody's listened, but make sure you hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. Make sure you follow us on our podcast provider and we are continuing as we mean to go on. So amazing people coming along. So today we're speaking to Mark. How are you doing, sir? Very well, mate. Good to hear from you and uh, congratulations on, well, making 100 and me being 101. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're, gonna, we're starting to mean to go on because I'm not going to give away too many things. There's a bit of a reference if you're watching on YouTube to something on your wall behind you. Um, but we'll come to your expertise in a second. Um, so I've had the privilege of working alongside Mark for the last couple of months. Um, it's amazing to have those conversations around leadership, about high performance. And I knew that he had to come and join me on the podcast. So it's quite nice in a more of a formal chat this it seems seems quite um quite good we're gonna have a nice chat about your experience and your takeaways from your journey as well and add value to the audience so mark as i hit the 20 minute timer tell us about who you are what you've done and what you're currently doing now off we go i'm mark hunter i'm a father of two i've got a young daughter kaya and a young son calvin four and one uh married to my lovely wife jenny who looks after me and looks after us all but my background comes from elite sport, so um, I was a professional athlete for 16 years in the Olympic rowing team, competing in the Athens Olympics, Beijing and London. London being a true home Olympics for me because my background, I come from the east end of London, um, a very um, normal working class family, not what you would probably associate with the sport of rowing. Um, people refer to the boat race, which is great, but to me, the sport is obviously much bigger than that. And my current role is I work at EY and it's young. So I've been there for four years now. I'm in the talent team. So working in learning leadership, uh, facilitating workshops, looking at high forming teams, doing coaching um, and trying to really elevate our clients, you know, to, I know it sounds really cliche to, to kind of, you know, building a better working world is what we kind of aspire to with the team I work in. So a lot of the work is face to face. Uh, obviously COVID made it virtual, but, uh, quite an array of different things we do uh, so that's my current role um, EY right now. Fantastic so we'll, we'll talk about your high performance and your achievements it's really fascinating that people don't um, sort of allude to sometimes their success because that's why I get people to introduce themselves so we'll come on to that but we'll, we'll stay with the questions so obviously hashtag leadership what's on your mind and what comes to your mind when you just hear the word leadership? God, so many things actually, um, because I think images come of different people that have been in my life that I've aspired to or learned from leadership. But for me, it's about kind of having empathy, being thoughtful of people around you, you know, your integrity to want to support people, develop people, respect for them, being able to listen to people. I think a big thing that um, some leaders that I work with, that they just aren't very good at listening. I think that's such an important aspect and really inspiring people through change, you know, and, and helping them define what their goals and outcomes may be. So for me, it's about really supporting others to help them get better at what they do. Yeah, amazing. Awesome. And so we're, we're staying with you personally. And this is really interesting talking about professional athletes, because sometimes when I ask the question about, are you a leader? Even people in the corporate world don't foresee themselves as leaders. And it'd be interesting to see your journey and what we might pick on up on this later um, but staying with you where do you think your leadership journey started so what is it on reflection a long long time ago or was there a pinnacle moment where you thought right I need to start being a leader where, where are we going back to there's first well, I think in different walks of life that I kind of started to think about this so when I was younger I challenged the stereotype of rowing again I didn't do go to university I did an apprenticeship on the River Thames to be a, a captain of all the best would you see. So that was probably my first transition to being a leader because if you get things wrong, people could die. It's as simple as that really. Something goes wrong on the boat, um, you crash into something, you'd be in trouble. There's a various things that can happen. So leadership in that context, you know, so looking after people, making sure we're doing things in the right way. Uh, and then if I moved into sport, it took me some time, I think, to 
really kind of harness those skills of leader in sport. And it was probably after I came back from Athens and the disappointment of the Olympic Games, we came last, last in the event. And then I was given the captaincy of Leander Club, which is the premier rowing club in the world. Um, it's got more Olympic medals to its name than any other club in any sport. And when you're a leader or a captain, if you've been successful, it's very easy for people to galvanise and follow you. But when I come last, there's a lot more skills and probably groundwork you have to put in to get people to buy into you. So being a captain of that club, I remember some of the members thinking, what is going on here? Why is he the captain? Um, but the people that put me in that position obviously saw something and it enabled me to develop not just as a leader, but as a person, an athlete, human being. So it helped me in so many ways, deal with the disappointment, but then understand the fundamentals that were, I think, important to me to be a leader, to bring the best out of others. Yeah, fascinating. That's what I was going to say about what, why do you think or what, how do you think, why did that happen? Tell me, dig into a little bit more detail, because that's very quite interesting isn't it that you got that given that role and sometimes I dig into people's like where do you think that foundation what did they see to give you that role how did that happen I think sometimes you know people have more belief in you than you have believe in yourself that's that's a big thing that I've kind of learned is the way that people perceive you is very different most of the times the way you perceive yourself mm. um obviously if you're not a vain person and you think you know you're, you're the finished ass or anything like that and that's always been fascinating for me when I've been in different environments, the way that people talk to me and the way that I help them and the way that I come into a room or the conversation I create. And that's just something that I think is just a natural thing I've developed over years. It's not something that I've actually thought about, but the more that people tell you those things, the more that you see that as that's a real kind of natural skill or talent I have that I, you know, I, I don't, I need to obviously keep working on that, but that's something that I have in my back pocket. Um, and that's just something that's evolved over time with understanding what, and I think it comes back to asking those questions, you know, asking people questions, not about yourself, but when you start to ask questions, you know, people will start to open up, become honest about different things. And then at some point they would start, maybe this has really helped me. You've done this, you've done that. And without really probing those questions, people start to feel comfortable because they start to trust you, um, and telling some, saying some nice things rather than things you're not doing. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Excellent, awesome. So um, we always ask people about, is there a moment or a person that's had a really good impact? I say really good, it could be really bad, an impact of some sort on your leadership journey. So the person you are now, um, where who would you pick or what would you pick as a, like a pinnacle impact on who you are now? So it's a big one for me. I've been really fortunate. So my dad has been a huge impact on me as I've grown up with being a coach, being a teacher. He's had so many things he's done where he's, he's worked and assisted and supported, you know, people in different walks of life. So watching his style, you know, we're looking at the stuff that he does really well and the things that actually, I, I think I can do that better. So learning from the stuff that is really good and the things that I think I can elevate. Um, and then also experiences that haven't been good where I've been in an environment which has been quite toxic and this type of leadership I don't want to be part of or ever see again. Um, so combining the good and bad has enabled me to kind of create what I think is my own style. Um, and really, it's always about other people and trying to ask those better questions to get the most out of them. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. So can you take us through, you've mentioned about Athens. Can you take us through your performance journey up to London? So what you did achieve, obviously, last like, yeah. to, to get around from that was there just a quick question before we start there actually was there a moment when you came last in Athens and thought that's this is not for me definitely yeah okay definitely I class it as the flame when I was younger was kind of lit by what I watched on tv watching the Olympic Games being inspired by it and watching Great Britain win gold medals in rowing and watching the Union Jag being raised high anybody else's or the National Anthem and gold medal literally blew my mind. Mm. And that's where the flame kind of ignited in me. And then I remember when I came last in Athens and that was part, that when I talk about bad leadership, that was a really toxic time. It was really challenging. And then the result didn't go to plan, so I made it even worse. And then coming back from that, when I came back to the UK, I had no self-confidence, no self-belief. I was really struggling, really struggling. At that point, 
I was at a crossroads. I could have either called it a day and tried to get a job because I had nothing. I had no money. I, no, I had literally nothing. Or I, I go again. And it was from the people around me, like the support network around me, not just family, but like coaches that I'd work with or friends, just their, their kind of prompting and supported me and they'll be just actually, uh, is, is there something I can achieve in this? And then we started to create some like short-term goals, a little longer-term goals, and it kind of went from there. But that was definitely a period where I could have walked away because... Mm. When I mean it went bad, it was it was horrific. It was so difficult to deal with. And yeah. I've only learned about some of the challenges I was going through, like personally, you know, mental health back in 2004. No one spoke about it. You know, you, you mentioned anything like that back then and people would have laughed at you. But now we can actually have those conversations. And back then I had no idea what was going on. But I was in a period of kind of severe depression, but I had no idea yeah. what it was because I didn't know... Uh, the kind of triggers, uh, the feelings, the, the, the challenges in your mind, you know, things you would avoid. Um, but then I was doing a mental health workshop and I learned about these things that all these light bulbs were, oh my, that's what was going on at that time. Um, because you tend to reflect on your own experiences when you someone starts talking about those. And then I came out of that with that support group helping me. And then that allowed me to kind of start to rebuild the self-confidence and belief uh, the captaincy came on board, being a captain of Leander, you know, that driving, helping other athletes gave me something to really attach myself to, to help others. And then I had to learn to speak at events and dinners. I was such a shy person. I would never have done that before. And that made me to become a better leader because I could actually speak out. I could have an opinion yeah. on things. And then going towards uh, Beijing, the year before we won a bronze medal, so we were medal potential, and then the 2008 Olympic season, we went unbeaten and we won every single race and then won the Olympic final. And that dream started as a 14-year-old and I was 16 years later, I was 30 and I'd achieved my, it was my lifetime ambition to be Olympic champion. Yeah. I remember thinking back to those, those dreams I had as a kid and the ambition I had, that obsession I had with trying to be the best uh, and win, win Olympic gold. And then I was content. So I remember when I kind of came back, I was content. I was done. I'd, I'd done everything I wanted to do and I retired and then went to California for a year to, to coach in uh, UCLA. So I lived in Santa Monica for a year. And that was another type of leadership because I was, I was in charge of 20 um, freshman novice rowers. Uh, I was coaching the female like, rowing team, you know, dealing with all the dynamics of people leaving home, coming to university for the first time. It's kind of like big brother to them all, trying to help them with that transition, trying to lead them in the, in the sport environment and their rowing. You know, it was, it was a real interesting time for me to develop and grow again. And then watching them in the sport made me realise why I loved it. The friendships you make, that, you know, you're doing a sport you're passionate about and you get to be healthy and train and travel and you forget about these things when it becomes your job. So then I decided, started to think about London being home games, my boss was an ex-retired Olympian from the US team. We retired after Barcelona, came back for Atlanta. And she said a home Olympics is something unique. It, it is the most prestigious thing, you know, the most unique thing you'll ever be part of. And that's what kind of started the ball rolling with that. And then I came out of retirement, came back to the UK, won two world titles and then went to London um, on paper because we were Olympic champions and double world champions. You'd have said, yep, gold medalist. But we had a really challenging season and we weren't going well. And we literally nearly pulled off the great escape. We got a silver in the end, which was heartbreaking because we were going to have to win. Um, but a couple of weeks before, if you'd have asked anybody in the team, they'd have said, they're not going to do it. They're not going to win anything because it just wasn't, wasn't clicking, wasn't working. And there was a few things that had broken down with the fundamentals of being a high forming team that we'd lost. Um, but we sorted them out with a few weeks ago and, and nearly pulled off the great escape. So yeah, last came last. So I got the good, the bad and the ugly. And I came last one gold and came second. So the that, good, that's the an good. absolute, that, yeah. what a roller coaster. Yeah. What so, an yeah. absolute roller coaster. <laughs> I, I, when I first met you, um, I, I went back and go, you know, that, that interview that people talk about and see about the absolute, but uh, just giving everything. Like you can only, as an athlete or if you've ever been doing any sport you know 
kind of what that feels like. But at that level, at that stage, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Um, the um, so so now you're obviously bringing all this experience mm-hmm. outside of the sports bubble. And I, the reason I say that we chatted just before, didn't we, coming on that. I had the same experience coming out of the military bubble, but what what's your perspective now about how much you bring from your background and how it's received and how how people in the corporate world can really attach onto some of the little things that can really improve? Because remember, the audience is trying to level up their leadership journey. So what's been your experience about coming out of that bubble and how did you find that transitioning and then having building the confidence in that world again? Yeah, I enjoy sharing stories and insight. You know, I get a real buzz out when somebody takes something from that. Um, Because, you know, I come from one sector of sport and, you know, I got to the highest level, which was great. But it's weird you never see it like that. But, you know, the way that the Olympic champion is kind of looked at, you know, is the the pinnacle of what you can achieve in your sport. Um, And for me, it's about sharing the kind of day to day things that you do, like the overall result. You can't predict what the outcome is going to be. You can prepare physically and mentally, but um, you never know what your competitors are going to do. So you're trying to deliver your best performance. And I think it's more about the process that you go through on that daily basis. And that is the learning experience that comes with, you know, we all have good and bad days. You know, we all know that we're human beings. Um, But just little things that we would put in place to support our team or as individuals um, understanding people's strengths and weaknesses, appreciating them, and trying to guide them through that. You know, having open dialect communication all the time, giving and receiving feedback in the right manner that's right for that individual, not for you, for the whole team, because everybody receives information differently. Um, and there was just a whole host of things that we did that I enjoy bringing to life, but not just verbal diarrhea of it, you know, picking the right moments to kind of share that and for me, one thing that I did lose for a period, actually, when I think about it, trying to do this is that I wasn't being myself when I was delivering sometimes. I was trying to be something I wasn't. So I'm trying to fit into that corporate world where I was speaking at an event or internally about six months ago and someone was like, I might just be self. What's going on here? And I was like, okay. And I went back to kind of what I felt were my roots. And it's had a massive transformation for me anyway as kind of facilitator running workshops. Um, and I think that is a, that's a core fundamental thing, just being yourself. Yeah. Um, because it's if you try and be something you're not, it, 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 it becomes very challenging. And yeah. also people can see for it very, very quickly. Yeah, do you know, it's interesting you mention that because I get commented about that all the time. The amount, 101 ep- episodes, the amount of people we've had on, and the level of which they've been very successful and the fact that people are they are surprised how relatable people are and like you said that you you are put on a pedestal an olympic gold medalist and it's been really quite refreshing to hear a story that you mentioned a couple of times we're all human and and that is so relatable I, i love that fact so we've got a couple of minutes left i want to dig into the high performance mindset and some of those one percent gains I know that we were chatting the last time that we were together about the, the boat to bed thing. So could you share what, what that is? And again, it goes back to the fundamentals, what you do consistently mm-hmm. aim for high performance, but mindset and then 1% gains. Yeah. So, so with regards to the boat to bed, that was something our team manager always went on about. And when I was younger, I didn't really appreciate it, but it was trying to cut down transport time. So when you're traveling to and from venues, if you're spending an hour each way, that's two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. You know, it's, it's a lot of time to be sitting on a coach. So he put in place a 40 minute boat to bed. So from the moment you get up in the morning, you know, whatever you're gonna do to get in the boat, it was a maximum of 40 minutes. Um, so that's, that to me was a huge marginal gain that we used and we use it to our benefit in numerous games because when we were competing, I never actually stayed in the Olympic Village. We always stayed close to the venue. So we were actually engaged and fi- fixed on our sport, not the razzmatazz going around the games. So that was something that really paid into to our favour when it came to those kind of final races and the big races because we weren't as fatigued because you think about you arrive early to the venue, like, sorry, the, 
the, the event, maybe five to 10 days before, then you've got a week of competition. You think about all those hours that would add up or minutes sitting on a coach. So it was condensing those down as much as possible. Um, I think a really useful one me and Zach had was we had a term called choose your mood. And that's how you turn up in the morning because, you know, we're going to come to work every morning. Don't come into work with your head down, shoulders down, miserable. Don't come in with a fake smile, but come in ready to go to work because mm -hmm. your body language and the way that you enter the environment will shape the day of activities of how people want to interact, work with you, challenge you, ask questions. So we would say, like, listen to some music or a good podcast, obviously, Leadership podcast would be a good one now. Um, but it's just, you know, something that would get you in the right frame of mind to enter that environment so you're ready to go to work. So that, yeah. that's just two very small things. I love that. Yeah, it's and, and again, it sounds, it's simple, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's that consistency and everybody's going to be slightly different. You hear about a lot of people having quite unique and different um, mindsets and habits and behaviors i said you didn't know last time did you have any um regimes or routines that you had to do but you said you, you didn't it's to try and set yourself up for success yeah and i think it's, it's those day-to-day -day things that you do that put you in that position i think if you've got little quirky things that you do just before if that goes wrong that puts you off and i never had any i i eliminated those when i was a young kid basically i was like wearing a type of socks or whatever it may be same what what awards but whatever it could be wear a watch or whatever it is I got rid of all those things because I just looked at, if I did the work covered every basis I was in the right position right frame of mind to go and deliver performance yeah. rather than I forgot something and then all panic kind of sets in so I made sure I eliminated those as soon as possible yeah fantastic so mark that is 20 minutes wow. unbelievable thank you so much for sharing all those insights and again getting behind the scenes and getting the insights of somebody who's been at that level but also delivering back into the corporate world is really interesting so thank you so much for your time and um, ladies and gents if you've enjoyed that make sure you tell us your takeaways everybody's different it's really quite interesting to hear all the little different nuggets of information people take because it's relevant to them at that time. So um, make sure you follow us on the YouTube channel. Make sure you follow and um, subscribe on the YouTube channel, sorry, and follow us on the podcast provider. And every Wednesday at 6 a.m., more amazing guests are going to be coming your way. Make sure you go back and listen to the 100th episode. And we look forward to adding more value across the, the re remainder of the year. So, Mark, thank you again for your time. Cheers. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye.